Welcome to Myositis 101 for Patients. This is our fifth video and so far we have discussed what is myositis, who develops myositis, uh, what are some uh, genetic risk factors for myositis as well as some environmental triggers for myositis. So today we will focus on how does a physician makes a diagnosis of myositis or how can we make a, an accurate diagnosis of myositis, what are the factors that go in in making a final diagnosis of myositis. First of all, we need to understand who makes the diagnosis of myositis. Typically what happens when a patient has some symptoms, they go to the general physician, a primary care doctor or a family doctor. When a family doctor or primary care doctor see the patient, it typically takes them a, a visit or two and certain blood tests for them to understand that there's something more serious might be going on with this patient. And that's because myositis symptoms are overlapping with many other common illnesses. So once your doctor thinks that there's something rheumatological, neurological or uh, skin uh, disorder going on, they generally refer the patient to either a rheumatologist or a neurologist or a dermatologist. Typically, at least in United States, the diagnosis is often made by rheumatologist, neurologist or dermatologist. In certain countries, diagnosis could be made by an internal medicine or a medicine doctor who's an astute doctor and has been uh, trained uh, in making a diagnosis of myositis. Typically, your doctor will look into various clinical features, tests, labs, and imaging to come to a final diagnosis of myositis. So today we will talk about what are those six factors that or things that the doctor should look into before reaching a final diagnosis of myositis. So first and foremost is clinical history and examination. Before going into the diagnosis of myositis, all the doctors, rheumatologists, neurologists, dermatologists, or internal medicine doctor like family doctor um, or primary care doctor would first do a detailed history and physical. In the detailed history and physical, we'll talk about some more specific things that could happen in patients with myositis. First and foremost is muscle weakness. What type of muscle weakness we are talking about is very important because many disorders have different types of muscle weakness. Myositis typically cause proximal more than distal muscle weakness. What does it mean? That means the muscles that are more towards the core of the body. So for example, the shoulder or the hip muscles, neck muscles or the back muscles or abdominal muscles are more affected than distal muscles like your hands or your feet. The second common symptoms that the patient present with is dermatomyositis rash, which is very important to make a dermatomyositis diagnosis. Often we cannot make a diagnosis of dermatomyositis in the absence of typical dermatomyositis rashes. Now the good news is that dermatomyositis rashes are typically very characteristic. The doctors who are trained in myositis or have evaluated and seen many patients with myositis or dermatomyositis could easily recognize the rashes of dermatomyositis in most cases. For example, the rashes of dermatomyositis include gotran papules. The gotran papules are the rashes on the back of the hand, a malar rash, which is little different than the malar rash or the butterfly rash of lupus, a heliotrope rash, which is on the, on the eyelids, or the swelling around the eyelids could also be seen called periorbital edema. And there are several other rashes. For example, you can have a V sign or the, or the, or the uh, rash on the upper chest here, or you can have a shawl sign rash on the upper back. Now, although most patients would present with muscle weakness and or dermatomyositis rash, there are sometimes other clinical features which are more prominent. For example, patient with antisynthetase syndrome could present with severe shortness of breath or cough to begin with. Or, for example, patient with uh, some other autoantibody in myositis can present with arthritis as the first presentation of myositis. Sometimes patient basically present with fatigue or low-grade fever and lack of energy to do anything. And other times patient could present with difficulty in swallowing. So when patient present with these clinical features, the doctor takes a detailed history, but then they confirm this history 
by a detailed examination. They will often check your muscle strength. So what we call is manual muscle testing. They will ask you to put your muscles up here and they will test different levels of muscle weakness in different parts of your body. So, and they will evaluate to see if you truly have proximal more than distal muscle weakness. That means the muscles of the shoulder is weaker than the muscles of the hand and the muscles of the hip is weaker than the muscles in the ankle and the foot. <coughs> Also note that the patient with inclusion body myositis or IBM may actually have distal weakness. That means weakness of their hand grip and their knees and foot more or first before they have the weakness of the shoulder and hips. So after the detailed history and physical, your doctor may suspect that you may have myositis, but generally they have to run a certain battery of tests to confirm the diagnosis of myositis. That is because many conditions could look or behave like myositis. Many neurological disorders, many rheumatological disorder could mimic myositis. So it's very important that we run some battery of tests to come to a final diagnosis of myositis. Typically, they run multiple tests and I will go over these tests one by one. One of the most common tests your doctor would run to confirm or understand the diagnosis of myositis is called muscle enzyme. Now there are five different muscle enzymes that we know. One of the most common muscle enzyme is CK or creatinine kinase, sometimes also referred as CPK. There are other muscle enzymes like aldolase, AST and ALT, which by the way, AST and ALT are also your liver enzymes and also an enzyme called LDH. But most commonly we use CK or creatinine kinase. Your doctor would test that and would find the levels of CK to be highly elevated in cases of myositis. Typically we see the levels of CK are under 200 in a normal healthy individual. In a person who is well built, it might be 500. In certain patients, it could be as high as 800, but it could be completely normal at 800 level. These patients typically don't present with muscle weakness. Patients with myositis most commonly would have levels of muscle enzyme higher than 1000. Also note that not all patients with myositis present with elevation of muscle enzyme. It is true for about 70 to 80% of myositis patients would have significant elevation of muscle enzyme, but some may not have normal muscle enzyme or some may have very low level of muscle enzyme elevation, typically seen in cases of some dermatomyositis or juvenile dermatomyositis or antisynthetase syndrome where lung disease is the predominant complaint. The second test we will talk about is called EMG or electromyography. It is typically done with a, another test called nerve conduction study or NCS. This is a test in which the patient would get certain needle pricks or small electric shocks in different parts of their body, generally their muscles, um, to evaluate what's the electric activity of the muscles and nerve. Now this is done to evaluate is the weakness coming from muscle or it's coming from nerve or a neuromuscular junction, which means the junction between the muscle and the nerve. So it's a very useful test to first of all, rule out many neurological conditions, which could also present with muscle weakness. The pattern seen on EMG could suggest that this patient may have more likely diagnosis of myositis or less likely diagnosis of myositis. So it's a very useful test. And also this test could be used to select what muscle to be biopsied to confirm the diagnosis of myositis. The third test we will talk about is muscle MRI. Nowadays, many doctors prefer to do muscle MRI over EMG. Typically, the reason is that EMG could be painful to certain patients, but muscle MRI is easy to do for many patients. Muscle MRI can show the signal in the muscle. Generally, what we see is edema or swelling of the muscles seen on muscle MRI 
um, that could suggest again that there could be myositis. And also, similar to the EMG being used to understand which muscle to be biopsied, muscle MRI can also be used to decide which muscle to be biopsied. Also, more importantly, the pattern of muscle uh, edema or swelling uh, seen on MRI could help us differentiate between polymyositis as compared to dermatomyositis as compared to inclusion body myositis. So MRI in last 5 to 10 years have uh, gained a lot of importance in myositis. So after the detailed history and physical, muscle enzyme level testing and EMG or muscle MRI done, your doctors would often rely on muscle biopsy or skin biopsy in case of dermatomyositis rash to make a final conclusive diagnosis of myositis. I often suggest that you need to have one of the two biopsies in all myositis patients before making a final diagnosis. Either have a muscle biopsy or a skin biopsy if you have a skin rash. Except in certain conditions, for example, antisynthetase syndrome, where the patient may not have muscle weakness or rash to be biopsied itself. It is very important to select what muscle to biopsy and typically the selection happens with either the EMG or the muscle MRI. And typically the muscles to be biopsied are either the deltoid or the thigh muscles to be biopsied in myositis. Last but not the least test that I recommend in every case of myositis is to test something called myositis autoantibodies. There are about 15 to 17 myositis autoantibodies that exist today. And although these myositis autoantibodies are not absolutely required for making a final diagnosis, but they are very helpful in many cases to confirm the diagnosis. But more importantly, when we know what myositis autoantibody you have, we can predict your disease course better. We can understand what clinical features you may, may have or what uh, complication you may, may develop in future. And also certain times it help us to guide the treatment. Now, note that not all patients would have myositis autoantibody. If we take about 100 patients, I think about 60 to 70 percent of patients would have one of the 15 to 16 myositis autoantibodies known today, but not all patients. So if you don't have a myositis autoantibody, you still can have a diagnosis of myositis based on the other tests we talked about. So we've talked about to suspect myositis, we need to do detailed history and examination followed by certain blood tests such as muscle enzymes um, and myositis autoantibodies perhaps are very important and helpful, uh, followed by either an EMG or a muscle MRI to guide a muscle biopsy um, and followed by a muscle biopsy and or skin biopsy to come to a conclusion or conclusive diagnosis of myositis. But do we need all of these tests to make a final diagnosis of myositis? And the answer is no. But more tests you have, more confidence a doctor would have on his or her diagnosis. Typically, I say that you have, you need about four or five of these to make a conclusive diagnosis of myositis. With that, I will end here. Thanks a lot for listening. And I would request all my viewers to subscribe so that you can access the next video as soon as it's available. Um, the next we will talk about what's the difference between muscle weakness versus muscle pain versus fatigue or muscle fatigue in myositis.